heart of the frozen Arctic, a decommissioned Cold War facility stirs back to life, this time with a mission shrouded in secrecy. A team of elite operatives, led by the hardened Colonel Eric Stryker, descends into the icy abyss to recover alien technology buried beneath the glacier. But the deeper they go, the darker the truth becomes. What lies frozen is not just technology, but an ancient malevolent force capable of twisting reality and consuming human minds. The Strikers team unravels the horrors hidden below. They must face the terrifying question. Will they be the next to vanish into the icy void? The Svalbard Bunker Experiment 2 Dark Horizon By Margot Holloway It's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. Part 1. The Return In the bitter, frozen wasteland of the Arctic Circle, the facility stood like a relic of a long-forgotten terror. Beneath the weight of ice and snow, it had been buried in silence, the only evidence of its existence being the chilling whispers of rumours passed among the highest ranks of governments. To the world, it was nothing more than a failed Cold War experiment, the official report citing psychological collapse as the cause of the previous mission's catastrophic end. But those who knew the truth were not so quick to dismiss what had happened deep beneath the glacier. Now in the early winter of 2024, the facility stirred to life once again. A secret international task force, made up of elite military operatives and leading scientists, had been dispatched under the guise of scientific research. Their mission, however, was not to investigate the collapse. They come to retrieve something far more valuable. Alien technology. According to classified intel, buried beneath the ice, frozen for millennia, lay a life form far beyond human comprehension. Mentally dormant, or so they hoped, his presence was believed to hold the key to unimaginable advancements in military and technological power. At the helm of the operation was Colonel Eric Stryker, a man whose steely temperament had been forged in the fires of countless covert missions. His face was a mask of stoic control, but beneath the surface he harboured a gnawing fear, a fear rooted in the secrets he carried. Unlike the rest of his team, Stryker had been given a grim briefing, one that delved into the horrors that lay beneath the Arctic ice. In shadowy meetings, far away from official record, Stryker had learned about the alien presence, an ancient, malevolent force capable of bending human consciousness to its will. It wasn't just the hallucinations or paranoia that concerned him. It was the knowledge that this entity could distort reality itself, turning the minds of those it touched into a chaotic battlefield. There was more to this mission than the team knew. Stryker had been assigned an unspoken task, to uncover the fate of Colonel Anderson's unit. Officially, Anderson's team had vanished in the frozen wilderness, the last known mission at the facility long buried under layers of Cold War secrecy. But Stryker knew better. Anderson's team had been sent to the facility for the same reason, and they had never returned. The cover story was airtight. No one survived to challenge the lie, and the true events were wiped clean from any record. But Stryker had seen fragments of the classified reports, cryptic transmissions, garbled pleas for help, and references to things that no sane mind could comprehend. He hadn't told his team about Anderson. He couldn't. If they knew the full truth, that another highly trained task force had vanished without a trace, it would shatter their morale. Oh, his orders were clear. Find out what happened to Anderson's men, if possible, but under no circumstances was he to alert the others to the catastrophic failure of the previous mission. For Stryker, the weight of these secrets was a heavy burden, one that gnawed at him even as they descended into the icy abyss. He couldn't shake the feeling that, just like Anderson's team, they were walking into something they weren't prepared for, something far beyond their understanding. The team's transport hummed through the Arctic storm, descending towards the facility now little more than a dark smudge against the icy landscape. From the outside, the building appeared as nothing more than a bunker, partially reclaimed by nature. 
Ice had encased much of its exterior, giving it the appearance of a tomb long abandoned by the living. The entrance door, twisted and frozen, was sealed shut as if the facility itself was resisting their return. Once inside, the team was greeted by silence so complete it seemed to press against their ears. Their breath misted in the frigid air, and the sound of their boots crunching against the frosted ground echoed through the narrow hallways. The facility had become a graveyard of steel and shadow. Lights flickered dimly as emergency power failed to properly illuminate the deeper sections. Cold winds funneled through the darkened halls, carrying with them the faint smell of rot and decay. Cryptic symbols and incoherent writings were scrawled across the walls in blood and frost. Messages left by the previous team. Warnings, perhaps, or the last remnants of their crumbling minds. Dr. Ingrid Halverson, the lead scientist on the mission, brushed her gloved hand against the etched words, her breath catching as she traced the jagged lines. They were trying to communicate something, she whispered, but no one dared to respond. The air felt heavy with a presence, although nothing moved. Colonel Stryker motioned for the team to press deeper, past the ruins of the previous experiment, toward the heart of the facility where the real prize awaited. The alien entity, presumably still trapped beneath the ice, its mind powerful enough to control the thoughts of those around it, even in its frozen state. Yet as they descended into the lower levels, there was a growing sense of unease. The walls were unmoving, solid steel, but they now seemed to close in on them. The temperature dropped further as they moved deeper, a bone-chilling cold that no amount of protective gear could keep at bay. The team's radios crackled with static, and occasional whispers drifted through the silence, just beyond the edge of hearing. Whether it was the wind or something else, no one in the group could tell. It wasn't long before the first of the team began to feel it, a strange sensation, as if eyes were watching them from the darkness, lurking just out of sight. Tensions mounted. One of the soldiers, Corporal Elias Kovich, muttered under his breath, with his fingers twitching on the trigger of his rifle. We shouldn't be here, he whispered, his voice trembling with something unspoken. This place, it's not dead. It's waiting. Colonel Stryker gave him a sharp look, but he couldn't deny the unease gnawing at the back of his own mind. They all felt it. The glacier above them groaned under the strain of shifting ice, but it was the silence that weighed heaviest on them all. A silence that felt... alive. As they approached the central chamber, the source of the alien presence, the tension in the air thickened, the cold deepened, and the writings on the walls became more frenzied. It was as if the facility itself was trying to scream a warning they couldn't understand. Awakening As the team pushed deeper into the frozen heart of the facility, the sterile, decaying corridors gave way to something far more alien. They had stumbled upon a chamber that none of the original blueprints had mentioned, a hidden section buried even further beneath the glacier. It was unlike anything that had been seen before. The walls were smooth, almost organic, made of a strange metallic substance that pulsed faintly with an eerie bluish light. The air hummed with energy, as if the room itself were alive, waiting for them. Dr. Halverson led the charge into the chamber, her scientific curiosity overriding the growing sense of dread. In the centre of the room lay a massive, cylindrical structure encased in a web of frost. The object was clearly not of human origin, its surface etched with a complex pattern that seemed to shift under the dim light. She approached it with wide eyes, gesturing for her team to begin extracting samples and data. This is it, she whispered. This is what we came for. Alien technology, millennia old. Colonel Stryker did not share her sense of awe and wonder. Standing back with the other soldiers, he felt a knot tighten in his stomach. His instincts screamed at him to stop them, to pull everyone out of that chamber and back into the cold, desolate corridors above. But his orders were clear. Gather as much intelligence as possible, before destroying the alien presence. He clenched his jaw and watched as Dr. Halverson's team set to work. 
as they extracted pieces of the ancient technology, uploading data into their portable systems and prying frozen fragments from the strange machinery. The atmosphere in the room shifted. What had once been cold became something altogether different, an unnatural, biting frost that sank deep into their bones. The lights flickered, and the hum in the walls grew louder, more ominous. The ground beneath them vibrated, almost imperceptibly at first, but enough to make the team pause. What the hell is that? Sergeant Nolan muttered, glancing at the pulsating wall. The faint glow now flickered erratically, like a heartbeat skipping in panic. Before anyone could answer, a deep, resonant groan echoed through the chamber. A sound that reverberated off the walls and drilled into their skulls. It was as if the glacier itself had come to life, shifting, stretching after centuries of dormancy. The lights again flickered violently, and the temperature plummeted. Frost crept up the wall, spiralling out from the alien machinery like cold fingers reaching toward them. Colonel Stryker's radio crackled to life with garbled static. Voices from the outside world briefly cutting through before disappearing entirely. Base to Omega-1, come in. Base to Omega- The signal was lost. Communication had been severed. Then came the first scream. Corporal Elias Kovic, standing closest to the chamber's exit, dropped to his knees, his hands clutching his head. His rifle clattered to the ground as his body convulsed. His eyes, wide and wild, darted around the room, seeing something that wasn't there. His mouth moved, but his words were garbled, as if speaking a language none of them understood. The other soldiers rushed toward him, but before they could reach him, Kovic let out an inhuman scream. Stay away, he shrieked, his voice now deeper, guttural, as though something else was speaking through him. You should have stayed away. His eyes were no longer his own. They glowed with the same eerie blue light that pulsed from the alien technology. The team froze in place, horror etched on their faces. Stryker rushed to Kovic, grabbing his shoulder and shaking him, trying to snap him out of whatever trance he'd fallen into. But Kovic's eyes locked onto the colonel's, a malicious grin curling his lips. You woke it, he hissed, his voice barely above a whisper. But it echoed in Stryker's mind as though spoken by a hundred voices at once. Now it will take you all. Before anyone could react, Kovic lunged at Sergeant Nolan, his movements unnaturally fast and violent. He tackled the sergeant to the ground, his hands tightening around Nolan's throat. It took two other soldiers to pry him off, his strength unnervingly powerful for someone of his size. When they finally pulled him back, Kovic's face was twisted in a snarl, his eyes still glowing with that unnatural light. He thrashed against their grip, muttering in that same guttural language, something dark and ancient. Dr. Halverson backed away. Her eyes were wide with terror. It's the alien presence, she whispered. It's controlling him. Stryker barked orders, his voice steady despite the chaos. Sedate him now. The team scrambled, injecting Kovic with enough tranquilizers to knock out a full-grown bear. His body slumped to the ground, but even as his eyes fluttered shut, he muttered something low and chilling. It sees you. It knows you. The alien presence had awakened, and it was no longer content to stay dormant. As they dragged Kovic's unconscious body from the chamber, the cold continued to intensify, and the machinery at the room's center began to hum louder, the vibrations growing more violent. The facility, once silent, was now alive with something ancient and malevolent. Stryker stood at the chamber's entrance, watching as frost crawled up the walls and the alien machinery pulsed with newfound energy. He had known this mission would be dangerous, but, well, not like this. They had awoken something far more powerful than they could have imagined. And now, it was only a matter of time before it consumed them all. With Kovic's words echoing in his mind, 
You should have stayed away. Strecker realized the real horror had just begun. Day 3 The frigid corridors of the facility seemed to close in around them as the days wore on. What had begun as a carefully coordinated mission to retrieve alien technology had spiraled into a waking nightmare. The air grew colder, unnaturally so even for the Arctic. Frost now spread across every surface, climbing the walls, creeping up the steel beams, and dusting the equipment. The temperature gauges seemed useless, reading lower and lower each hour. But worse than the cold was the silence, broken only by the occasional flicker of the lights and the distant sound of voices. Voices that shouldn't be there. By the third day, the team had fractured into two distinct factions. Colonel Stryker, trying desperately to maintain order, had gathered those still loyal to their mission objectives, extract the alien technology and, if necessary, destroy the alien presence. But a second group, led by the increasingly unhinged Corporal Jonas, had other ideas. Jonas, who had spent more time than anyone studying the alien technology in the hidden chamber, now believed he could communicate with the aliens. He claimed they were offering something, an alliance, a form of negotiation. They've been here for millennia, he said, his eyes wide and feverish. They can teach us. We just need to listen. Stryker had tried to reason with him, but it was no use. Jonas was too far gone, and the worst part was, others were beginning to believe him. Dr. Halverson, her rationality crumbling under the pressure, was among the first to side with Jonas. She believed that the strange symbols scrawled across the facility's walls were a form of communication, a way for the aliens to reach out. This is their language, she insisted, tracing a line of frost-covered writing with trembling fingers. They're not trying to hurt us. They want to teach us. But Stryker knew better. Whatever was happening here wasn't benign. It was hostile, predatory. The alien presence was spreading, seeping into their minds and twisting their thoughts. And the hallucinations, those were becoming impossible to ignore. First, it had been small things, flickers of movement in the corner of their vision, shadows that darted just out of sight. But soon the entire facility became a nightmare of distorted realities. Soldiers would catch glimpses of comrades who died in the previous mission, their frozen bodies walking the halls as though they'd never left. Twisted faces appeared in the frost, watching them through the icy walls. The hum of the alien machinery was always there, lurking beneath the surface like a heartbeat, only audible when everything else went silent. Private Harris was the first to snap. He'd been on the edge for days, muttering to himself about voices in the walls, about figures he saw moving just beyond the reach of the dim lights. When Sergeant Nolan found him standing in one of the lower corridors, Harris was staring into the ice, his breath fogging the frozen surface as he whispered to something or someone on the other side. They're in there, he said, his voice hollow, watching us, waiting. Nolan barely had time to react before Harris turned the rifle on himself, his blood freezing almost instantly on the cold metal floor. After that, the paranoia only worsened. Stryker knew they were running out of time. The temperature continued to drop and now even the strongest willed soldiers were beginning to show signs of mental breakdown. Frost crawled up their skin, turning their fingers blue and their breath ragged. Dr. Halverson's hands trembled constantly, and her eyes had a distant, glassy look, as though she was seeing something the others couldn't. The facility itself seemed to pulse with life. The cold had a presence now, a sentience that wrapped around them like a vice, constricting tighter with each passing hour. And the alien influence, it was growing. At first it had been confined to strange electrical anomalies, Flickering lights, malfunctioning radios. But now, it felt like the glacier was coming alive, reaching out for them and drawing them deeper into its frozen depths. The worst of it came when Corporal Jonas made his move. In the dead of night, he and his followers attempted to sabotage the mission's only means of escape, trying to disable the team's transport and cutting off their communication lines to the outside world. They believed 
truly believed that they could commune with the alien presence and unlock something greater, a power beyond human comprehension. Jonas stood in front of the group, eyes wide with fervor as he preached about the alien's gifts. We're on the brink of something incredible, he shouted. Don't you see? This is what we were sent here for, to make contact, to learn from them. But his words fell on deaf ears. The tension snapped like a taut wire and a firefight erupted. Those still loyal to Stryker fought back against Jonas and his followers, but it was chaos, wild, desperate, and bloody. In the confusion, someone, a soldier whose mind had been overtaken by the alien presence, set off a chain of explosions in the lower chambers. The blasts tore through the facility, ripping apart steel walls and sending waves of frost and debris through the halls. In the aftermath, as the dust settled and the fires began to die down, Stryker realized the full extent of what had happened. The facility was in ruins, and the alien presence, it was no longer contained. The cold had seeped into everything. The walls were covered in a layer of thick frost, creeping outward, consuming the facility inch by inch. And the people, his soldiers, the scientists, had been taken. Some stood like statues, their skin encased in ice, their eyes staring blankly ahead, as though they'd frozen where they stood. Others wandered the halls, their minds shattered, mumbling in the alien language, their bodies twisting and contorting in unnatural ways. The alien influence was everywhere now, feeding off their fear, their madness. It had spread from the glacier into the facility, and soon it would spread beyond that. Stryker knew what was coming next. The outside world was watching, waiting for the signal. If they couldn't destroy the aliens soon, the nuclear strikes would be launched, obliterating the facility and everyone inside it. But even as he prepared for the final stand, a sickening realization dawned on him. The aliens weren't trapped anymore. They were free. And they weren't just after the facility. They were after their minds, their very souls. The cold, the whispers, the hallucinations, these were just the beginning. The real horror was still to come. Part 2 Conduits The walls of the facility continued to pulse with an icy, malevolent energy, as if the glacier itself had become aware of the intruders. What had once been a mission of opportunity had now devolved into a battle for survival. And worse, the realization that the true threat was not just physical, but mental, weighed heavily on the team's dwindling numbers. Stryker, now visibly pale with exhaustion, stood with his remaining soldiers and scientists in the dank, dark control room. The atmosphere was tenser than ever, and the air seemed even colder. But now it was clearer than ever, that this was not from the Arctic chill outside. This was something deeper, more invasive, as if the very oxygen they breathed was tainted with the presence of the alien life form that now permeated the facility. Dr. Halverson, who had remained surprisingly composed up until now, was the one who broke the silence. Her voice was strained, as if she were speaking against a heavy pressure. It's... It's using us, the aliens. Our consciousness is feeding them. Every interaction with their technology, every moment we stay here, they are growing stronger. She shuddered, clutching the edges of the console for support. They've been dormant for millennia, she continued, her voice trembling as the truth sank in, frozen in that glacier and trapped. But now we've given them a way out. Not through physical means, but through our minds. They're using us as conduits. And if we don't stop them soon, they'll take complete control. The team stood in stunned silence. It was as if the puzzle pieces had finally clicked into place. But instead of clarity, they now felt only dread. Every strange anomaly, every flicker of the lights, every eerie whisper in the wind, it all pointed to one terrible reality. The alien presence had been growing, feeding off their very thoughts and emotions. 
Their presence in the facility was giving the aliens life again, a twisted resurrection that was happening not through blood and flesh, but through their consciousness. Every time we touch their technology, every time we look at the symbols, they are in our heads, Halverson whispered, her face pale as she rubbed her temples. It's not just hallucinations anymore. They are rewriting us, turning us into them. Before the full weight of the situation could be processed, a sharp, garbled crackle erupted from the nearby radio. Stryker rushed to the console, adjusting the dials, trying to clear the static. Through the interference, a voice emerged, cold and mechanical, but unmistakable. This is command. The situation has been deemed irrecoverable. Stryker's heart sank. He exchanged a grim look with his second-in-command, who muttered, oh, This can't be good. The voice continued, emotionless and final. In 48 hours, a series of nuclear warheads will be deployed. Their destination, Svalbard. This facility will be annihilated to prevent the alien presence from escaping. You have two options. Eliminate the threat, or evacuate immediately. Time is running out. The radio transmission then faded into static, leaving the room in heavy silence. The implications were staggering. Stryker's team now had a cruel deadline hanging over their heads. 48 hours before the ice, the facility, the aliens and themselves were obliterated by the raw force of nuclear fire. The team erupted into chaos. Some of the soldiers shouted angrily, accusing command of abandoning them to a nightmare they had never been prepared for. Others fell into a stunned, numb silence, their minds grappling with the countdown to their potential demise. But Stryker, as always, maintained his steely resolve. Listen up, he barked, silencing the room. We have two choices. Either we destroy that alien presence, or we get out of here before those bombs drop. But I can tell you one thing, we are not dying here, not like this. His words were strong, but in the back of his mind, Stryker couldn't shake the gnawing doubt. Could they really destroy an enemy that had existed long before humanity had even crawled from the caves? One that now had the power to bend their minds to its will. Halverson stepped forward, shaking her head. Escape isn't an option. You've seen what they can do. They'll follow us into our minds, into the world. There's no running from this. She swallowed hard. The only way we can stop them is if we sever their connection to us, destroy their technology, or die trying. Desperation flickered in the eyes of every team member. It wasn't just the aliens they had to worry about. It was each other. The more the alien presence spread, the more fractured their minds became. Harris had already fallen under its influence, and others were showing signs of the same fate. Paranoia, strange behaviours, and violent outbursts were becoming common, and it was only a matter of time before the team splintered completely. Corporal Jonas, standing in the shadows, suddenly spoke. His voice was calm. Too calm. You're all fools, he said, his eyes gleaming with something unnatural. They don't want to destroy us. They want to elevate us. We should be embracing them, not fighting them. Stryker turned to face him, his hand instinctively moving toward his side arm. Jonas, you're not thinking clearly. That's the alien influence talking. Jonas smiled, an unsettling, almost serene expression that sent a chill throughout the room. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're just too afraid to see the truth. We were meant to be here, to find them. This is destiny. In a flash, Jonas lunged at one of the control panels, his hands moving with purpose, inputting a series of commands that none of them recognized. Before anyone could stop him, the entire facility shook violently, as if the glacier itself was groaning in protest. Lights flickered, systems whirred to life, and the hum of the alien technology grew louder, more pronounced, filling the air with a deep, resonant pulse. Oh, the alien presence was no longer dormant. 
Jonas had awakened something far worse than they had ever imagined. As the facility trembled under the weight of its full reawakening, Stryker and the remaining survivors realized they had crossed a threshold. There was no turning back. The countdown had begun, both for the alien invasion and for the nuclear strikes that would soon rain fire and death upon them all. With 48 hours left, the question now wasn't whether they could destroy the alien presence, it's whether they could survive their own minds long enough to do it. Confrontation The Arctic facility had become a maze of horrors. Flickering lights barely illuminated the jagged tunnels as icy winds howled through cracks in the walls. The deep cold, once a mere physical discomfort, now felt alive, grasping, tightening around the team as if the glacier itself was conspiring against them. Their breaths came out in ragged gasps, the freezing air tearing at their lungs, but none dared stop. They were too close to the end, yet so far from salvation. Stryker led the remaining survivors deeper into the bowels of the facility. Behind him were only a handful of soldiers and scientists, faces hollowed with exhaustion and terror. The alien presence was everywhere now, a constant overwhelming force pressing against their minds. The once crumbling walls now pulsated with an eerie glow, the alien technology embedded within them humming in unison with their own thoughts. It was as if the very structure of the facility had fused with the alien consciousness, feeding off their fear and despair. They're close, whispered Halverson, her voice trembling. We need to keep moving before... A low guttural sound echoed through the tunnels, cutting her off. It was followed by a scraping noise, like something enormous dragging itself across the ice. And then from the shadows, the figures appeared. At first they seemed like familiar faces, fallen comrades, Harris, Jonas, and others who had been lost along the way. But their movements were wrong, too fluid, too coordinated. Their eyes gleamed with a cold, unnatural light. They were puppets now, their bodies commandeered by the alien presence, twisted into mockeries of their former selves. They're using them, muttered Stryker, the realization dawning with a sickening weight. They're using their bodies. As if responding to his words, the figures moved faster, advancing toward the group in a grotesque procession. Their mouths were open, and in voices not their own they spoke. You should never have come here, they rasped, their voices layered with something inhuman. This place is ours. Panic gripped the team. Gunfire erupted, the sharp cracks echoing through the tunnels as the soldiers tried in vain to fend off the approaching horde. But bullets barely slowed them. The alien-controlled bodies moved with an unholy resilience, staggering forward even as they were torn apart by gunfire. We can't stop them, one of the soldiers yelled, his voice laced with desperation. And Stryker knew he was right. They were fighting the aliens on their own terms now, in their domain and they were losing, fast. Fall back, Stryker barked, his voice cutting through the chaos. We head for the core. That's the only way to end this. They retreated deeper into the labyrinth of ice and metal, the alien-controlled bodies following relentlessly. The team numbers were dwindling with every step. Soldiers fell, dragged into the dark, their screams echoing briefly before being cut off. And every time one of them died... Another figure appeared among the alien thralls, their body reanimated, twisted, and controlled. The core of the alien presence lay in the deepest chamber of the facility, a vast cavern filled with an unnatural blue light. Strange spindly structures extended from the walls and ceiling, pulsing with energy. At the center was the heart of the alien force, an enormous crystalline structure, half buried in the ice, radiating a cold so intense it made the very air shimmer. Stryker and the few remaining survivors stood at the entrance of the chamber, staring at the alien core in horrified awe. That's it, Halverson whispered, a voice barely audible. That's where the control is coming from. Ah, we blow it, Stryker said, his voice grim. He reached for the detonator charges in his pack. 
we end this now. But as he began to plant the charges around the core, the alien presence struck. It wasn't a physical attack. There were no more bodies shambling out of the shadows. Instead, it came as a wave of psychic force, crashing into the minds of every remaining team member. Stryker stumbled, clutching his head as his vision blurred and twisted. The walls of the chamber seemed to shift and distort, melting into each other. Shadows writhed at the edges of his sight, and disembodied voices whispered in his ears. You're too late, the voices hissed. You can't stop us. Stryker's grip on reality faltered. He saw Halverson standing across from him, but then her face changed, twisting into something grotesque, her eyes black and soulless. He blinked, and she was back to normal, but the image was burned into his mind. Around him, the rest of the team was succumbing to the same mental assault. One of the soldiers, unable to distinguish reality from the hallucinations, turned on his comrades, firing wildly into the chamber. Another dropped to his knees, clutching his head and screaming, his mind overwhelmed by the alien whispers. Ah, damn, we're losing them, Stryker shouted, but his voice felt distant, as if the words were coming from someone else. He struggled to plant the last of the charges, his hands trembling as the alien presence clawed at his thoughts. Then, Halverson's voice cut through the madness. Stryker, you have to finish this. He looked up to see her standing by the core, her face pale and streaked with tears, but her eyes burning with determination. Do it, she screamed, her voice trembling with desperation, before it's too late. Stryker forced his mind to focus. With one final agonizing effort, he set the last charge around the crystalline core. His thumb hovered over the detonator. He could feel the alien presence pushing against him, trying to pull him into its grasp. But he wouldn't let it win. We're not yours, he growled through clenched teeth. Not yet. He pressed the button. The charges exploded in a deafening roar, the shockwave tearing through the chamber. Ice and metal shattered, collapsing in on the core. And for a moment, everything was chaos, a whirlwind of debris, light and sound. And then, silence. Stryker lay on the ground, barely conscious. His vision was a blur, his body numb from the cold and the impact of the blast. Around him, the remaining team members were still, either dead or too weak to move. The alien core was destroyed, but at what cost? The facility was collapsing, and the countdown to the nuclear strikes was still ticking. Stryker knew they had only a few hours left to escape, if escape was even possible. As he pulled himself to his feet, a cold voice echoed through the chamber, sending a chill down his spine. You think this is over? The voice whispered. We are far from done. Stryker turned, his heart pounding. The alien presence had not been fully destroyed. It had merely retreated, waiting for another chance to strike. And time was running out. Part 3 Race Against Time As the dust settled from the explosion, Stryker's ears rang with the aftermath of the blast. The alien core was gone, reduced to shards of glowing crystal beneath the ice. But there was no time for relief. He dragged himself to his feet, fighting through the dizzying haze in his head. His body ached, his lungs burned with each cold breath, but survival instincts took over. We need to move, Stryker rasped, scanning the chamber for the remaining survivors. Alverson staggered to his side, blood smeared across her cheek, but her eyes were still sharp. She was one of the few left standing. Around them, the facility groaned ominously, metal creaking and ice cracking, threatening to cave in at any moment. The explosion had destabilized everything. The cold, once a biting chill, now felt like a living entity. Frost was creeping up the walls, spreading faster than before, and the glacier itself was reclaiming the facility now. The ground shook under their feet. Striker! 
Alvison shouted over the noise, pointing to a distant door half buried under ice. That's our only way out. The countdown to the nuclear detonation was ticking relentlessly in the back of their minds. Two hours, maybe less, before everything in Svalbard would be vaporized. There was no time for second guessing. They had to run. They gathered what little strength they had left, dragging the remaining survivors. Three soldiers, all barely conscious, set off through the labyrinthine tunnels of the facility. The air was thick with dust and debris, and the lights overhead flickered weakly. Every step they took felt heavier, every breath more labored, as though the facility itself was resisting their escape. They pushed onward into the frozen maze, the walls closing in around them. Ice began to collapse from the ceiling, shattering on the ground like glass. One of the soldiers, barely able to stand, was crushed under a massive chunk of falling debris. But there was no time to mourn. The facility itself was tearing apart. Stryker could feel it. The alien presence wasn't gone. It lingered, subtle at first, like a distant hum in his mind, but growing stronger with each passing moment. He glanced at Halverson, seeing the strain on her face, the same haunted look that had overtaken their comrades during the first experiment. She was hearing it too. The uh, core's destroyed, right? One of the soldiers, Samuels, gasped as he struggled to keep up. We blew it to hell, Amos. Why? Why do I still hear them? Stryker didn't answer. He didn't have to. The whispers were faint at first, but unmistakable threading through their thoughts like a persistent, invasive force. Words, indistinct and foreign, echoing in their minds. They weren't hallucinations. This was real. The alien consciousness hadn't been obliterated. It had infiltrated them. Uh, keep moving, Stryker barked, but his voice cracked, the weight of the realization bearing down on him. The whispers grew louder. You think you've won? The voice hissed inside his head. You've only made us stronger. Stryker shook his head, trying to block it out. But he could feel the cold seeping into his bones. Not just from the ice, but from within. It was the same creeping unearthly frost that had overtaken the others. The same chill that preceded the alien takeover. As they reached the final stretch, the exit in sight, Halverson stumbled. She fell to her knees, clutching her head as if trying to hold something back. Stryker, they're in my mind. I, I can't. Get up. Stryker grabbed her arm, pulling her to her feet. Come on, we're almost there. But even as they broke through the last door, emerging into the blinding white wasteland of the Arctic surface, the truth was undeniable. They hadn't escaped the alien presence. It had escaped with them. The cold wind bit at their faces as they staggered through the snow, but the chin inside their minds was far worse. The whispers were louder now, clearer, as if the aliens were speaking directly to their consciousness. You're ours now. Alverson stopped, her eyes wide with horror. Stryker, what if we didn't destroy them? What if... He didn't want to hear it, didn't want to believe it. But it was there, eating away at the back of his mind. They'd destroyed the physical core, but the alien consciousness had already infected them. It was inside them, embedded in their thoughts, waiting to take full control. The facility behind them rumbled ominously, on the verge of collapse, but it no longer mattered. Even with the nuclear countdown ticking away, the real threat wasn't buried beneath the glacier anymore. It was walking in the snow, inside their heads, and there was no escaping it. Stryker glanced at the horizon, where the sun was beginning to set. The darkness was coming, and with it the realization that their battle was far from over. The aliens had won a greater victory than they'd ever imagined. And now, they had all the time in the world. Escape. The striker, Halverson, and the remaining survivors stumbled out onto the frozen expanse. The biting arctic wind tore at their faces, but they barely felt it. The adrenaline, the panic, the overwhelming dread. They were numb to everything but the pounding in their heads. 
The horizon was a desolate white blur, and in the distance a low rumble signaled the imminent nuclear explosions that would obliterate the facility and everything within it. Thankfully, Corporal Jonas's attempts to sabotage the team's transport had been unsuccessful. The survivors could at least put as much distance between themselves and the coming nuclear explosions as possible. For a brief moment, there was silence. A cold, empty quiet that stretched over the snow-covered wasteland. It felt like the calm before the storm, a heartbeat before everything would be gone. But then a faint crackle cut through the static of their comms. Stryker froze. His breath caught in his throat as a voice, chilling and unmistakable, echoed from the facility far below. You cannot destroy what's already inside, it whispered, slow and deliberate, as if savoring every word. We are beyond the ice now. The team sat paralyzed inside the transport, their eyes wide with disbelief. Halverson's face turned pale as the voice, so cold, so alien, wrapped itself around their thoughts. It was coming from the facility, but somehow it was also coming from within them. No, no, it can't be, Halverson whispered, her breath visible in the freezing air. We destroyed the core. We... Stryker shook his head, already knowing the terrible truth. He felt it deep inside, a presence that was no longer bound to the frozen glacier. The alien consciousness had spread beyond its icy prison. It had infiltrated their minds. The realization hit him like a blow to the chest. The aliens had never needed their bodies or their technology. They'd been waiting for something far more valuable. Their consciousness. Oh, they've been inside us the whole time, Stryker muttered, his voice barely audible over the wind. As if to confirm his worst fears, the ground beneath their vehicle trembled. In the distance, flashes of light lit up the sky. Brilliant, violent explosions ripping through the ice as the nuclear strikes hit their targets. The bombs were detonating, just as planned, erasing the facility and everything it held. But it was too late. The real threat had already escaped. A sharp pain lanced through Stryker's skull. He clutched his head, gritting his teeth against the sudden onslaught of whispers. Voices, alien and incomprehensible, poured into his mind, speaking in a language he didn't understand but somehow felt. He glanced at Harverson and the others, their faces twisted in the same agony, their eyes wide with terror. They could all hear it. The whispers were growing louder, more insistent, twisting their thoughts, warping their sense of reality. The voice from the comm was now inside their heads, entwined with their very consciousness. We are with you now. We are everywhere. Stryker's heart raced. They weren't alone anymore. None of them were. Alverson stumbled in her seat, her eyes glazed as if she were looking through him, past him, into something far beyond the physical world. It's in us she whispered, her voice shaking. We brought them out. Stryker's mind reeled. The facility, the glacier, the mission. It was all a diversion. The aliens had used them to escape, to break free from their frozen tomb. And now, with their consciousness embedded in the survivors, they were no longer confined by the ice. They could spread. They could evolve. They were far more dangerous than anyone had imagined. The nuclear blasts that were supposed to save them were nothing more than fireworks now. The real battle hadn't been fought in the tunnels or the laboratories. It had been fought inside their minds. And they had lost. <sighs> we're compromised, Stryker said, his voice low, almost defeated. We didn't stop them. They're inside us. Alverson nodded, tears welling in her eyes, her hands trembling as she gripped her weapon. What do we do? she asked, her voice barely above a whisper. But Stryker didn't have an answer. The sky lit up again as another distant explosion rocked the ground. The countdown was almost over, and in minutes the entire area would be leveled. And yet, even as the world around them prepared to burn, he could feel the alien presence growing stronger, 
spreading deeper into his mind, twisting his thoughts, making him question his own reality. There was no escape. Not from this. As the final bomb detonated, casting a fiery glow across the Arctic landscape, Stryker and his team drove on through the snow, silent and horrified. The alien presence had won. It had taken root inside them. Now, with nothing to hold it back, it would spread far beyond the ice, far beyond the Arctic, far beyond anything they could imagine. The battle wasn't over. It had only just begun. In the distance, the last transmission echoed once more, fading into the static of the comms. We are with you. Always. Stryker's eyes narrowed, his pulse quickening as the terrible realization washed over him. They weren't survivors anymore. They were carriers. And whatever came next, whatever horrors the aliens had planned, they would be a part of it. To be concluded. Okay, so you heard it right there at the end. That is to be concluded in a third part. So, um, thanks to all of you for the feedback you gave, the input for suggestions of where the story could go. It was a bit of a battle between, like, action, adventure, and psychological horror, and, um, sort of, it leaned more towards, uh, the psychological horror, as you could tell. So, um, they ended up pretty much in a similar, maybe worse fate than the, the first group. So, um, where are we going to go with this next? More input, please. The author says she will definitely take it into consideration like she did last time, and the story will be guided by you and concluded by you. All right, so you might be uh, giving yourself spoilers by doing this, but anyway, you know what I mean. So your participation is greatly appreciated by uh, Margot Holloway, the author. So she will uh, take that into consideration and build the end of the story around what you've suggested. Okay, um, thanks for listening again. Okay, there will be a third part for that. Still working on a couple of mega stories, you know, multiple hour epics. So one of them is coming along very soon. I'm doing a bit of recording every day towards that. All right, getting to the point where I'm waffling. So um, thanks for listening again. Till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.